So um, I want to welcome you here. I want to um, also recognize that we have, we have faculty here, we have students here, we have broader community members here. All of you are welcome, and we hope that this, this time that we have together will be a time where we can share and learn more about political identity that Andrew's going to share with us. So those of you who are in chapel already heard this, so I'm going to do a reintroduction for those of you who weren't in chapel. Andrew Prevo is an associate professor of theology at Boston College. He writes and teaches at the intersection of spiritual, mystical, systematic, and liberation theologies. He does phenomenology and continental philosophies of religion. And as Tony says, that means he's really smart. So we've had a, a delightful time last evening and this morning learning some more about Andrew and his work and his background. So without further ado, I just would like to introduce you to Andrew Prevo. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Mary, uh, for that introduction. Thanks to the Aquinas Center, the Catholic Studies Program, Candler, Emory, um, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, you know, just all, everything that's making this possible. Um, the title is, of my talk is, Who Do You Say That I Am? Which is a quote from Mark 8:29. Questions of Identity and Theology and Politics. So let me spend a while framing the question. Although I appeal to uh, this passage in Mark in my title, I do not intend to comment at any length on this gospel or to wade in the convoluted history of debates about the so-called messianic secret. I am not a biblical scholar, but a systematic theologian who is troubled and fascinated by questions of identity as they crop up in both scholarship and contemporary political struggles. I'm interested in the question that appears in this passage of Mark, who do you say that I am? I want to understand this question itself. Uh, in the course of this talk, my goal is to share with you some of my provisional thoughts about it. Um, and I've kept the references to a minimum because I don't want to inundate you with bibliographical information. But if you have questions about sources I'm using, just please ask. Um, so let me give you a little biblical context just to get us started. Jesus addresses this question to his disciples on the road to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. This is the second question he asked them on this road. The first was, who do people say that I am? His disciples replied, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. These are the sayings of the people, the anthropoi, that is, of others farther removed from Jesus. Compared with the phrasing of his first question, his second one implies a relationship of greater intimacy. It introduces a conceptual contrast between a they, the people, and a you, the disciples with whom he's speaking. He asks, but who do you say that I am? That is, others may have opinions about me, but what do you say, you who have given up everything to follow me, you who are devoted to me, you who are with me at this very moment, how do you articulate my, my identity? This time, the answer comes from Peter. You are the Messiah, Christos. This is a Christian utterance, if there ever was one. It is a reply that christens Jesus by naming him the Christ, the anointed one of God. The intimacy of their relationship is conveyed in Peter's use of that precious word, meant for face-to-face -face communication, you. He is talking directly to Jesus and praising him with a stunningly lofty name. As I said, though, I am interested in the question itself. Who do you say that I am? Jesus is not the only one who can ask this question, and the context in which he asks it is not the only possible context for it. To take a uh, trivial example, you you could address this question to your neighbor sitting in this room with you right now. Um, I'm not saying you have to do that. This isn't a sermon, so it won't be as <laughs> interactive. Um, but you could. You theoretically could. 
Uh, perhaps this is someone you know quite well. May maybe they are a close friend or even a romantic partner. I'm not sure. It also may be the case that you are total strangers. But whatever, whatever the case may be, regardless of the level of prior experience and knowledge you have of this person, to ask them this question, who do you say that I am, is to open up a space of some interpersonal vulnerability. To ask it sincerely is to give the naming of one's identity over to another, if only momentarily. And this can be a dangerous thing to do if you are genuinely receptive to what the other has to say. So why ask such a question at all? Why not just decide for oneself? Why not avoid the danger of this type of exposure to another by simply picking one's own name and identity? I'm not convinced that the matter can be handled that easily. The idea of sovereignly choosing how to define oneself when pushed to the extreme becomes a solipsistic fantasy or nightmare. There is no such thing as a private language in which one could formulate such an identity in pristine isolation from others. To speak even about oneself is to live in a world of relations that precede you and that reverberate in the, in the voice that arises from your body. Who do you say that I am? This question, which at least partly gives the meaning of one's being over to another, gestures toward an inescapable fact or feature of human life. It points toward the fact that one comes to exist only by being thrown into a world which is already made, and for that matter, badly broken. It indicates that one is not self-constituting in any absolute sense, but rather composed of physical, chemical, biological, cultural, historical, and social materials, forces, structures, and so on. None of us falls ready-made from the sky. We are born, we grow, we speak, and we die in environments that prove that our lives are not entirely our own. Our lives are shared from conception. There is no possibility of avoiding identity-forming relationships with others. There is only the question of how one will experience these relationships and how one will actively respond to and within them. So yes, I do believe in the possibility of active response. That is what is sometimes called agency or freedom. To be caught in a web of relations is not the same thing as being exhaustively determined or scripted by them. The dignity of our human existence consists in the fact that we can respond to our circumstances. We are not puppets controlled by strings, but spirits made of flesh and bone. To be able to respond means further that we must take responsibility for ourselves. Because we can do good, we ought to do it. And that means we ought to exert some measure of control over our, our lives as individuals and over the contributions that we make to the various ecological, interpersonal, and social relationships that envelop and define us. The question, who do you say that I am, is something we must frequently address to ourselves. For example, in the mirror each morning or while doing an Ignatian examine uh, at the end of the day. Such critical self-reflection is an indispensable part of acquiring a virtuous character. Being constitutively relational as we are does not exempt us from the task of making ourselves um, better people, making choices oriented toward developing and deepening who we are in relationships with one another. On the contrary, being relational intensifies this obligation to reflect on ourselves because it demonstrates that the stakes of our own personal and moral formation are not limited to our own identities, but extend also to the effects that we have on the entire web of persons and things with which we are connected. So although I must frequently ask myself who I am in order to keep developing as a person and as a moral agent, I must also continually ask others in countless small ways who they think I am in order to gauge the effects that my ways of being are having upon them. So you might not have to come right out and ask the question, but this is information you need to be getting from the relationships that you have. How am I affecting what's going on in these contexts? 
But I have to be careful about this, though, because the vulnerability involved in this act of exposure can be harmful if the others to whom I give a chance to say something about me are misinformed, malformed, or worse still, malicious. Sometimes a sassy retort is in order. You don't know me. Yeah, I don't know if any of you ever say this or have used it. Uh, it can be very helpful. You don't know me. You don't know anything about me. Um, so that retort is a way of telling someone, I am not letting you have any power over me. You who perhaps, by reason of your race or sex or some other sign of unequal power distribution, are saying something or implying something about me that would serve only to keep me in my so-called place. And, and you might say, I, you don't know me in order to reject the implication of all of that. So the ch tricky thing, though, is that, is that it, it's impossible to respond in this way to everyone all the time. So we have choices to make about what views from the outside we let in and which ones we block out. But we cannot control this boundary absolutely. There are times when we must let our guards down and share our deliberations about ourselves with others in our lives. In the course of a, of a life, it is necessary to find some opportunities for trust, wherein I can let another see me and hear me and genuinely invite them to tell me who it is that they see and hear in hopes that their words will be ones of profound love and understanding, even if they also sometimes become challenging or critical. Our constitutive relationality and our capacity for response imply that our lives are imbued with a remarkable level of contingency and dynamism. We are not the sorts of things for which the question of identity could be answered once and for all. We are all works in progress. We are products of our material relations with the world and our more or less well-considered responses to them, and much of this is subject to change. The best answers to the question of who a person is are therefore not provided by static categories like race, sex, um, height, etc., but by a narrative or narratives which detail the effects of relationships and choices over time. Even the best narratives, though, leave much to be desired in so far as they cannot possibly communicate the overwhelming excess of what it means to live in this world for even a single day let alone six or eight or 10 decades. The best biographical accounts, in my opinion, are not those that accumulate the most facts about a person's life, but those that give a vivid sense of their profoundest motivations, wounds, and strengths. The most successful narratives are ones that compel you to ask yourself who you are at your core, deep down in your most complete spiritual nudity before God. This essential self is a deep and abyssal mystery. To have an essence in this sense is an aspiration or a dream that a person can at best realize imperfectly in different times and places. A good story of a life will highlight the situations and contexts in which this brilliantly dark center shines through. In a moment of trust with a loved one, the question, who do you say that I am, becomes a, an invitation for someone to help you see who you really are amid all the chaos and turmoil of life. It is a request that one's existence and essence might be unified, if only for a brief moment in this intimate conversation, but perhaps also in a lasting way that one can carry forward as a living memory and stable sense of self. We all need at least a provisional sense of who we are nurtured by affirming relationships with others in order to survive and to flourish. But to be clear, I, although I'm using the word essence here, I am not in favor of any sort of essentialism, even of a strategic variety, whether with respect to race, sexuality, gender, or any other identity marker. Essentialism is the attempt to define what is proper to a specific group usually with an appeal to some sort of supposedly ontological or biological foundation. But it can also have so-called strategic forms which attribute certain fixed properties to a group merely for practical reasons, 
without insisting that they are ontologically or biologically founded. Essentialism fails on epistemic grounds by answering the question of one's identity too generically and perfunctorily. It fails on moral grounds by fueling disastrous histories of segregation, discrimination, alienation, exclusion, and oppression. In these ways, it has given the mere idea of an essence a very bad name. This word seems to belong to a language game we no longer want to play. And yet, if we discard the word, we will have to invent another way to pose to ourselves the question of who we really are. I would like to retrieve this question, and perhaps even some notion of an essence, while fighting against and moving beyond the dangerous practice of any sort of essentialism. So that's what I'm really after here. Can we have a question of our essence, of who we really are, without falling into these essentialist traps? To, to have an essence should not feel like being put in a box. It should not feel like one's life is constrained or like there is an onerous list of behavioral requirements one must follow simply because one belongs or is thought to belong to a particular group. Rather, it should feel like gradually gaining a life-affirming sense of self that even the best possible narrative will not fully capture. The word existence refers indiscriminately to everything that we experience and that we do. But the word essence names that impossible task of reducing this unruly field of existence to a form which would render it intelligible without doing violence to it. Who among us would not like some words in which we could put our lives? Words that would bear them and represent them for us. Words that we could understand and use as a compass. Words that would give us back to ourselves with love and deep recognition. If we had this, we could call it an essence. Yet we never really have this in a very strong sense. We have approximations and attempts which always leave room for us to desire a more insightful account of, of who we really are and which inspire us to ask the question again, but who, who do you say that I am? For as long as we live, possession of an essence must always come with an asterisk, not least because the existence that is supposed to be represented by such an essence has not yet been closed. The meaning of our lives has to remain a somewhat open question while we'll, we still have left, while we still have time left, and while we continue to be susceptible of change. What I've just sketched out is a way of thinking that one might call an apophatic anthropology, that is, a doctrine of the human being which recognizes that its identity is never adequately captured by what we say it is, whether categorically or even narratively. For such an apophatic anthropology, existence is defined by a restless longing for an essence that perpetually eludes it. At the same time, I do not think it makes sense to adopt such an extreme apophatic posture that nothing meaningful can ever be said, and that the quest to understand oneself is presumed futile from the start. There has got to be some sort of cataphatic practice of naming and storytelling uh, provided by oneself and others, which has the potential to be truthful and life-sustaining, even if it is far from being perfect. So this sort of ap apophatic, but also a little bit cataphatic anthropology has been developed in recent years by phenomenological, postmodern, and postcolonial theorists who are interested in themes of opacity, ecstasy, hybridity, fluidity, and alterity, just to name a few of the buzzwords, um, and who employ these themes to combat violent essentialisms of various kinds. It also has deep roots in ancient mystical traditions, both East and West, which identify the ineffable essence of the human being as an image of or participant in the unnameability of the divine or the absolute itself. Finally, and perhaps most surprisingly, my own approach to this sort of anthropology, at least the version of it I'm giving you today, borrows ideas from scholastic think thinkers such as Thomas Aquinas, who teach that human beings are imperfect composites of essence and existence form and matter, body and soul, and so on. Although theologians have spent time exploring phenomenological postmodern and postcolonial uh, discourses 
and retrieving ancient mystical literatures, they have not thought as much about how the contrast that Aquinas draws between creaturely composition and divine simplicity might bear on contemporary questions of identity. So I'd like to say a few words about Aquinas in particular, and it seems you know, fitting to do so given that we're celebrating Aquinas Day. So um, let me turn now to Aquinas. So Thomas Aquinas on the question of identity. So picking up with a question with which I began, who do you say that I am? We've seen that Jesus asked this question to his disciples. But we should also note that the God of the philosophers does not ask this question. In fact, does not ask any questions at all. Nevertheless, this reticence on the part of the God of the philosophers has not prevented philosophers from venturing their own responses on this God's behalf. Aquinas, whom we celebrate today, offers one instruct instructive example here. Uh, in, his, in his third proof of God's existence in the Summa Theologiae Prima Pars, question 2, article 3, he concludes, quote, Therefore, we cannot but postulate the existence of some being having of itself its own necessity and not receiving it from another. And he says, this all speak of as God, end quote. While everything else that exists may come and go and depends for its existence on the contingent movements or combinations of other things, Aquinas argues that there must be at least one reality that exists in and of and through itself so thoroughly and definitively that it would be impossible for it not to exist. And this is what he calls a necessary being. And he says everyone would recognize that this is, this is God. Now, I'm less interested in the disputed question of whether this or any of Aquinas' five ways is a valid proof of God's existence, and more interested in the idea of God that Aquinas presupposes uh, in such arguments. In Prima Pars question three, he clarifies what it means to be a necessary being by arguing that God's existence is God's very own essence. The Latin here is Deus est idem quod sua essentia, that is, God is the same as his essence. This means that there is nothing in God's existence except what and who God is, God's very godness or divinity. There are no inessential details, there are no changeable parts, there is nothing that has to come from elsewhere, there is nothing that has to combine or grow to make God God. There is nothing on which God contingently depends for God's reality. God is purely and perfectly God's self from all eternity. In Prima Pars question 12, article 11, Aquinas draws on Exodus 3.14, the scene where Moses encounters God in the burning bush, and the name of God is revealed as Yahweh, I am who am. According to Aquinas, this biblical passage gives authoritative witness to the unique character of divine being, which um, philo philosophical reason also recognizes in its own way, namely that divine being does not rely for its existence on anything besides itself, but rather exists by its very own essence or nature. Aquinas' point here is not only that each minuscule aspect of God, if it even makes sense to talk this way, is shot through with the fullness of God's reality. For Aquinas, um, uh, excuse me, his point is also that God's identity is nothing other than to be in an absolute sense. For Aquinas, to say divine being is somewhat redundant. It's a pleonasm because being itself is divine. Being itself is the highest name for God in his thought. Aquinas explains that by contrast, Human beings exist only in a thoroughly dependent fashion as creatures of the creator, as finite beings that are subject to change, composition, and decomposition. Essence and existence are not identical in us as they are in God. According to Aquinas, the essence of a human being is determined by the genus animal and this special difference rational. 
The concrete way that this essence appears depends on the existence of a human body in a particular place and time, endowed with various inessential accidents, such as, quote, this flesh, these bones, this blackness or whiteness, etc., end quote. Aquinas thus argues that essence is a universal property. All human beings have the same essence or nature insofar as they are human. What differentiates them as individuals are their particular bodily features, which belong to their existence but not their essence. For Aquinas, the question of essence is answered pretty easily for human beings and any other types of beings that can be categorized by pairing a genus with a species, which is uh, the scholastic thing to do. That's how you get a definition. But we cannot know the essence of God because it is identical with God's very being, which is being itself, and because this is beyond what any genus can contain and beyond what any finite intellect can comprehend. In addition to discussing essence and existence as constitutive elements of the human being, Aquinas also talks about matter and form. It is important to understand Aquinas' terms matter and form in a precise way because his, meaning, his meanings do not match the common sense meanings associated with these terms in modern English. Matter is not synonymous with just stuff or like material things. It is not exactly what physicists would call matter. It is rather a condition of potentiality. Similarly, form does not mean shape or structure, uh, or not, it doesn't only mean shape or structure. It is also, uh, and more precisely, a condition of actuality. So a being composed of matter and form is necessarily a dynamic being, a being in process, which is working to actualize its potential. According to Aquinas, God is pure act, actus purus. There is no potentiality in God because God is always already fully actual, fully realized. Nothing is, is waiting to grow or develop. God's essence is to be, not to become. There is nothing lacking in God that time would somehow supply. God is eternal and complete in God's self. And in this sense, there is no matter in God, according to Aquinas. God is pure form. Now, we all know that human beings are different from God in this way. We need time to become ourselves. We are hylomorphic compounds, hybrids of matter and form, potentiality and actuality. This constitutive tension opens up a way to think about our identity that is not limited to the abstract universal, which Aquinas calls essence, namely the definition of our human nature as rational animal. Essence and form are not the same thing in Aquinas, even though sometimes people elide them. The form that we take is more individualized than the much broader category of human essence. It has to do with our character and with our virtues acquired through actions and habituations, pretty much everything discussed in the prima secundae and secunda secundae. What Aquinas' terminology does not seem to emphasize, as well as cont many contemporary discourses might, is that these somewhat individuating features of our actuality and potentiality, and even of our bodily accidents, as they are experienced in particular cultures and contexts, remember this flesh, these bones, this whiteness or blackness, that all of this might be worth including in a discussion of who we are, essentially. So Aquinas is going to bracket all of that out and say that's not part of the question of essence. My point is, well, maybe it is, or maybe it could be. Now, a Thomist might object that essence is strictly supposed to answer the question, what type of being are you in the schema of an Aristotelian science? And fair enough. Um, but I do think the question of essence has changed and broadened and developed over the last several centuries of philosophical and theological discourse. You know, um, we, we have brought this question of, of our essence closer to the messier realities of our existence and found it, therefore, much more difficult to answer. This is a, a move that phenomenology does, for instance. Any plausible account of essential identity today would have to include what Aquinas means by matter, form, and accidents, and that just at the level of categories. It would also require a narrative that gave the whole inquiry personal and contextual richness along with implotment and time. 
And even then, it would not be entirely satisfying because the question of identity would remain open-ended and inexhaustible. This is the apophatic piece. So in his discussion of the difference between men and women, Aquinas engages in a practice of essentialism that I would uh, very firmly oppose. Although he includes both men and women in human nature, he asserts that the particular nature of woman is, quote, defective and misbegotten, for the active force in the male seed tends to the production of a perfect likeness in the masculine sex, while the production of woman comes from a defect in the active force or from some material indisposition or even from some external influence, such as that of a south wind which is moist, <laughs> as the philosopher observes. OK, so a so few problems, few problems here. Um, <laughs> Aquinas is brilliant, but he's not, not, not all of his points are right. Okay, um, So here we have a very dubious ontological and biological essentialism explicitly used to assign women an inferior place relative to men. According to Aquinas, woman belongs to the genus of human beings, but has a specifically bodily difference which renders her deficient. He stipulates that her particular type of being is valuable primarily for the sake of procreation. Her essence is to be a helper to man and an instrument for the propagation of the human race. This way of talking about the essence of woman um, does violence to real women's lives. And my claim is that this is not what an essence should do. Um, an essence ought to be a true, good, and beautiful answer to the question of who we are. It should not be a structure of violence against who we are. Um, so suppose that women throughout time had collectively asked Aquinas, who do you say that I am? Now this is obviously a counterfactual, but bear with me. So suppose all women got together and they decided, well, let's ask Aquinas who we are. And um, he gave them this answer. They would be right to respond, you don't know me. That is, you don't really understand me. You don't know what relations have formed me and how I've responded to them. You don't know about me as an individual. And you certainly don't know enough about all women to define us as a group or to generalize in such a hazardous manner. OK, but now let's consider a different scenario. Suppose that the women of the world came together and instead of asking God, instead of asking Aquinas this question, they posed it to Aquinas as God, the God of the philosophers. Would the answer be the same or different? I suggest that it would, in fact, be different. Um, the answer that, that Aquinas as God would give would not be an essentialist one, but rather one tailored to the particulars of each person's life. In Prima Pars question 14, article 6, Aquinas argues that God does not merely know things according to general categories, but rather in a proper way that is closely attuned to the full textured reality of each precious thing. Aquinas quotes Hebrews 4, uh, verses 12 through 13, which says that the word of God reaches even to the division of the soul and the spirit, of the joints also and the marrow, and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature invisible in his sight. Aquinas concludes, quote, to know a thing in general and not in particular is to have an imperfect knowledge. If, therefore, the knowledge of God regarding things other than himself is only universal and not special, it would follow that his understanding would not be absolutely perfect. Therefore, neither would his being be perfect, and this is against what we have said above. We must therefore hold that God knows things other than himself with a proper knowledge, not only insofar as, as being is common to them, but insofar as one is distinguished from the other. Aquinas goes so far as to say in the 11th article of this question that God knows singular things, that is, things precisely in their uniqueness. In short, God knows us not from a distance, but intimately. God understands us in our complexities and minutest differences, even if we do not understand ourselves. God, and remarkably here, I'm still talking about Aquinas as God, the so-called God of the philosophers, is not an essentialist. Aquinas acts like one sometimes, but his God does not. 
This is something I've never actually heard anyone point out before, um, but I think it's true. So um, anyway, that's, that's my take on Aquinas. Okay, so. <laughs> All right, so let's go back to the present. I've given you a few thoughts on Aquinas. I want now to take a step back and approach the question of identity again, bearing in mind that it is, at, at the moment, a very controversial topic. There's that phrase you hear sometimes, usually hurled as an accusation, identity politics. Like, ooh, identity politics. You don't want to be doing that. <laughs> um, so hardly anyone uses this term as a positive descriptor for their own intellectual or activist works. One exception would be the 1970s black feminist organization known as the Combahee River Collective, which employs this term once in a well-known statement from 1977. But I will note that they use it once, and it's in passing, and I don't think even they today might, might use it in quite the same way. My sense is that the term has not been widely embraced by those to whom it is regularly applied. Even when one attempts to use it neutrally, for instance, in a news story or an historical account of a social movement, it tends to carry negative connotations. The expression identity politics packages the struggles of minority groups in a particular way that ultimately serves to discredit them. It undermines these groups by placing them in the same general category as the racist, misogynists, or homophobes that they oppose. The inescapable insinuation is that all of these practitioners of so-called identity politics are doing the same sort of thing and are therefore problematic for the same basic methodological reason. They supposedly do not argue for common, shared, human, universal, liberal, or democratic values, but rather for their own private interests. The term identity politics suggests a false equivalence between, for example, Black Lives Matter activists who want black women, men, and children to stop getting gunned down on the streets, and the white nationalists of the so-called alt-right who want the US to remain an aggressively white dominant country replete with Muslim travel bans, southern border walls, targeted policing of black and brown bodies, de facto segregation of neighborhoods, political disenfranchisement through gerrymandering and voter roll manipulation, uh, and economic and cultural exclusions of all kinds. I had to stop myself because I was going to spend another 20 minutes <laughs> listing off the other things, but le that's just to name a few things. So by lumping everything together and under the umbrella category of identity politics, one distances oneself from the fray. The very term has become a shibboleth indicating allegiance to an imagined rational center of politics, which is supposedly universally valid is alleged to have no ties to the messy, conflictual questions of identity that are, that are seemingly tearing us apart. In one sense, my response to critics of so-called identity politics could be summed up in the old aphorism, those who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. That is, be careful about hurling accusations which, on closer inspection, directly implicate you and your own work. My assumption uh, which I've, I've tested and I haven't found uh, anything that, to falsify it yet, is that the set of people whose political desires and aims are formed by their own particular circumstances and histories and experiences and efforts at self-understanding is a universal set. In other words, we're all doing it. If this sort of particularized formation of political goals is what identity politics means, then we're all, we're all in it together. Um, it becomes such a broad category that it gives no real basis for discerning the best path forward in any concrete political situation. Since it excludes nothing, to condemn it is necessarily to condemn oneself. The particular identity that critics of identity politics are seeking to protect is, I have already suggested, that of a self-appointed rational center. Behind that noble facade, however, there usually lies some unexamined attachments to the status quo on any number of so-called identity issues. There are concrete positions about immigration, law enforcement, public school funding, real estate, marriage, family, bathrooms, and so on, that one does not want to or cannot defend, so one instead disguises these positions as what is just ordinary, reasonable, or commonsensical, 
and one seeks to discredit anyone pushing for significant changes by condemning the localized quality of their moral and political struggles. The main problem with this approach at a theoretical level is that no one could survive the critique of identity politics if it were actually applied uh, universally and fairly. Um, one cannot out, opt out of one's particularity, that is, all of the biological, cultural, historical things that shape one. Um, and uh, one can only pretend to opt out and pretend that one is not pretending. And this is itself a very particular and dubious way to be. But the more important problem at a practical level is that the critique of identity politics pulls attention away from material contexts in which positive changes are urgently needed, you know, of, around issues of racial justice, um, around issues of sexual violence, gender-based discrimination, and so forth and so on. For these reasons, you can see that I am not persuaded by run-of-the-mill critiques of identity politics or even by the appropriateness of the phrase. At the same time, as I said earlier, I'm also not persuaded by any sort of essentialism, even of a strategic variety. We are not the sorts of beings for whom the question of identity can be so easily settled. Categories of race, gender, and sexuality offer some information, but generalizations at this level do not teach us all that we need to know about ourselves or others. They do not exhaustively define our essence in the deepest sense, that is, who we are in our spiritual nakedness before God. We must continue to ask ourselves and others in various explicit and implicit ways, who do you say that I am? In the final analysis, we must address this question of identity directly to the God who made us, who loves us in our particularities and even our failings, and who makes us anew in Christ. At its roots, this is not a question. It's not just a question. It's really a prayer. Who, who am I? Who am I called to be? What is this mortal life that has been given to me? And what have I done with it thus far? And what am I supposed to do with it going forward? These are questions we should be asking God. Although even the God of the philosophers might provide some insight here, I suspect that a richer sort of historical, liturgical, biblical, and practical theology would be a more auspicious context for this most important of dialogues. Let me suggest one Ignatian method of prayer and discernment. Imagine yourself talking with Jesus. Put yourself in the scene there with him and his disciples on the road to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Jesus has asked his question of identity, and Peter has responded, you are the Christ. A stunned silence comes over everyone as they try to take in the meaning of that remarkable utterance. After a few moments, imagine yourself finding the courage to continue the conversation, saying something like, Jesus, um, excuse me for the impertinence of my question. I know and believe that you are the Christ, but who do you say that I am? Who am I in relation to you? How might Jesus respond to you in this circumstance? What words would he give you as the delicate verbal clothing of your identity or vocation? And what would you do with these words? How would you respond to this interaction? Obviously, I cannot answer this question for Jesus or for you, but I can offer a few tentative reflections. First, I do not think he would just be nice. He would, as they say, keep it 100 <laughs> and tell you to your face what he thinks is really going on with you. Uh, if you were doing wrong, he would call you on it. He was a prophet and was not shy about denouncing people for going against the will of God. So um, if I know anything about Jesus, it's that he would tell you the truth. Second, his response would likely be expressed not in static, but in dynamic terms. Jesus seems less interested in the supposedly fixed social categories in which people fall and more interested in who they are becoming. His act of naming you would be a calling probably even an imperative. Come follow me. Third, his response to you 
would not just be about you. In fact, it probably wouldn't even be primarily about you. It would be about who you could become for others and with others. It would be about the best way for you to embody God's mercy and justice in this violent world where there are so many people in need. I am well aware that prayer can be an occasion for self-deception. It's all too easy to project onto God or onto Jesus the messages that we want to hear back or to fashion an idol in our own narcissistic self-image. I also know that an uncritical use of scripture or traditional Christian teachings and prayer might encourage slaves to obey their masters, wives to submit to their husbands, and gay and lesbian people to feel ashamed of their bodies, as if all of this were actually in keeping with God's will. Prayer is supposed to help us learn, learn who we are and how to be, but as St. Paul reminds us, we do not know how to pray as we ought. I suggest that we've got to be just as critical and discerning about the concrete conditions of our prayer lives as we are about anything else in this fallen world. Because prayer can be so badly distorted, practicing it does not make the question of discovering and living out one's proper essence a kind of overly simple or easy task. Prayer is no quick fix. Yet, prayer can provide a much needed place of refuge in which even if everyone else believes and thinks something wrong about you, especially because of your race, gender, or sexuality, you may still encounter a source of supreme knowledge and love who really sees you and knows you and wants you to be free. And this is why I love prayer and why I write about it so much. Um, it saved my life in more ways than I can count, and it is the deepest wellspring of my own liberative and solidaristic politics. It's, it's the reason why I think uh, some of my enslaved ancestors prayed, in order to discover a God who knew them and who could contradict the false messages they were receiving about their identity from the world. The dysfunction in our current political landscape demands a cultural transformation in the way we think about identity. Precious human lives are being damaged and destroyed by a recent uptick in hate crimes, inadequate medical and mental health care, lead poisoned water, family separations at the border, gender based violence, mass incarceration of people of color, especially nonviolent offenders, unrestricted access to guns, bullying of LGBT youth and even adults, and stubborn inaction on climate change which is a form of environmental racism. And millions of Americans, not just the president, have attached themselves to a particular sense of their identities, which allows them to turn away from these harms or to look past them. Many people are comfortable with who they are, even when part of who they are is a morally callous indifference to the suffering of others who do not look like them or sound like them or desire in quite the same way. They interpret their existence in the terms set by white supremacy, patriarchy, and homophobia as if this is what their lives have to mean if they are going to have any meaning at all. They do not want to let go of the only identities they know. They do not want to change. And they do not want to undergo the pain that such change requires, the pain of admitting wrongs and perhaps breaking off ties with a past or with one's own sense of power and status. And so they remain stuck in a version of themselves that, I think, if brought before Jesus and the nakedness of a face-to-face -face encounter, would not hold up. Others are caught in a place where they want to change, but do not quite know how. I am thinking, for example, of some students of mine who, after reading certain texts in black theology that I assigned, start to reckon with the ways that their family backgrounds make them beneficiaries of the American history of anti-black racism. Their own whiteness starts to become a seemingly intractable problem for them. This does not just mean that they have lighter skin and European ancestry. It also means that the economic, political, and cultural privileges attached to whiteness throughout the unjust history of this country generally fall in their favor. They can't erase this history. They can't ignore it. But even to acknowledge it in a self-critical way seems not to provide much of a path forward at first, except for shame and guilt 
uh, or other kinds of unproductive feelings. The phenomenon of white fragility, which is sometimes encountered in such conversations, is a type of understandable defense mechanism that derives from a need not to have one's identity fundamentally associated with evil, especially if one has not intentionally done anything wrong. I can see why some don't want to be white, but simply universal, rational, and so on, because to be white means associating one's sense of self with a politics that has very justifiably received a great deal of moral condemnation. I can also see why some want to double down and just affirm themselves regar regardless. They think in order to have an identity that corresponds to their bodily and familial existence, they need to do so under the banner of white pride or white nationalism. However, all of these are losing strategies, in my opinion. Endless self-recrimination, fake colorblindness, and especially the reassertion, reassertion of white supremacy are not helpful, to say the least. So what is a well-meaning white person supposed to do? Does their question of identity trap them in a no-win situation? So let's say they pose the question to me. <clears throat> Professor Prevo. Yes? <laughs> who, who do you say that I am? These, these are my white students talking to me, OK. So I've been trying. No one has done that in, that in those terms exactly. But versions of that have happened. And so I've been trying to work out a good response. And my impulse is to encourage them to reframe the question of their, their identity so that it cannot be answered sufficiently by the mere fact that they are white. Although they should not bracket or deny this fact, they should also recognize that they are dynamic relational beings who can use their lives for the good who can make changes and connections and relationships, and who can strive to contribute to a better possible world. The question in each, concrete, in, in each concrete case will be how best to do this. That's the sort of question that they need to continue to ask themselves and to discuss with other trustworthy people. It's also the sort of question that I think makes sense to bring before God. Who does God want them to be? What potential does God see in them that they might cultivate in their lives? Uh, what, what is their calling, really? What is their vocation? You know, whiteness is not really a vocation, or shouldn't be. Um, it's a fact of, of our current historical situation. But what are you called to do with your body and with your lives and with your relationships? That's what I'm trying to get my students to think about. We all need a sense of ourselves. We need, a, we need a sense of the meaning of our existence, what we are fundamentally about, what we stand for, what we will fight for, what we love, what moves and uplifts us. And, and this is really what I would call essence in a proper sense of the term. I know of no better way to respond to our collective political problems than to encourage a rigorous and sincere search for this better version of ourselves. We need an identity politics in which identity is not a fixed object, but rather a question for reflection, dialogue, and transformative social action. I have sometimes heard people say, quote, I appreciate the problem that such and such a minority group is facing. But if I'm not part of that group, then who am I to do anything about it? It's a rhetorical question which means it's really a statement. It's a statement of fear about potential embarrassment, or maybe it's an excuse born of a desire not to do the wrong thing, not to say the wrong thing, or not even to do the hard work that it might take to, uh, to really be an active, meaningful contributor to that struggle. But my request would be that if you ever ask this to yourself rhetorically or say it to others, who am I to do anything about this? that you really you know, change that into a genuine question. And you ask yourself, well, who am I such that I might be able to do something about this? Who could I become if I started to really invest in and care about these issues that are affecting these people who are my brothers and sisters, whom Jesus demands that I love as I love myself? In short, my advice would be, don't settle for a version of yourself that Jesus would find wanting. 
Embrace the potential for change. Existence in time is a wonderful gift. It means that we do not have to remain stuck where we've been. It means that there can be newness, that you are not done yet, that your story has not been written, and that the question of your essence is not closed. To be sure, God loves you as you are right here and now. But I also think God wants more for and from each of us. So let's let Jesus' question, who do you say that I am, become a provocation toward ceaseless prayer and self-examination and tireless action. God's existence is the same as God's essence. As a creature in this fallen world, you and I are not like that. Our existence is a battlefield in which we are trying to discover, preserve, and make something of ourselves. And the greatest test of whether we are doing that well is how our lives affect those with whom they are connected. At the same time, if our existences are shaped deeply by love, then there is something of the divine in us. We have become Christ-like and holy, and this says more about our essence than any other static category might. So don't settle. You know, discover who you really are. Thank you. So I know many folks have to leave, uh, so no worries there. Uh, but those who can stay, I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, Professor uh, Primo, my name is Kwok Pui Lan. Yes, hi. Thank I, you. I know your work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I want to ask uh, two related questions. Uh, because uh, in your sermon and also in your presentation, you, don't, you demonstrated how well you combine doing theology with spirituality. So I want uh, you uh, to share with us how you were able to do that. That's the first question. Okay. The second question I want to ask, it seems that according to my reading of this dialectic thinking of Aquinas, when you asked, who do you say that I am? You must ask this question, who do you say that I am not? Mm. It seems that answering that question is so important to the first part. So many of us define ourselves by answering the second question. Mm. I am not black. I am not male. Okay? And, and then it seems to me that we must hold that intention. Mm. Uh, and then, so I want to ask this question. How having read so much Aquinas shape your own sense of thinking theologically? I'm talking about the logic of thinking. Thank you. Th thank you very much for those questions. Um, so before I studied theology, I was practicing spirituality, although I wouldn't have known to call it that. Um, I was praying. Um, I was, I was thinking about my prayer life, trying to understand what it really means. And so I went into theology searching for a place in the academy where I could um, express and explore and go deeper into the spirituality that I had from my youth and that continues for me today. And so this question of the unity of theology and spirituality for me was always a given. And if theology was ever done in a way where it didn't connect with my spiritual life, I didn't, I didn't respond very well to it. I didn't understand why we were even calling that theology. You know, it seemed like that would be some, that needed a different kind of name. Because the living God, for me, is the one that we encounter in our lives of, of contemplation and worship and so forth and so on. So if, we're, if we have anything to say about that God, it has to be connected with those spaces and contexts. Um, I really like your point about part of this question has to be, who am I not? You know, a, a process of elimination where you're saying, well, I'm not, I am not, you know, this, that, or, an, or another thing. And sometimes those exclusions, though, can be related to the power dynamics that we're struggling to address. Um, so I think, I think that rounds out what, what I'm suggesting there. Um, 
We, know, we don't know who God is, but we can say who God is not. And there's a kind of negative theology there that Aquinas is performing. And I think we need to have that kind of negative anthropology with respect to ourselves. Sometimes we might not be able to pinpoint fully who we are, but we might be able to figure out some things about who we're not or what, we, what versions of ourselves we deny or reject. So thank you for that. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, Kyle Lambelay, postdoc here. I um, know that you're wanting to avoid the exegetical kind of scenario around uh, Jesus's question and Mark, but I do wonder um, what the fact that Jesus asked that question means for Aquinas's account of divine essence. So does the incarnation, does an account of the Trinity trouble his account of the essence of God? And how might we think as maybe Jesus is a little closer to us than the first person of the Trinity or un maybe understandable in different ways? How might that influence our uh, questions of uh, who am I? Because it's Jesus asking his followers who he is. He's uh, vulnerable in the ways that you described. God, him God in God's self is vulnerable in the ways that, that we also are vulnerable. Good. Thank you for that. Yeah, so if... If Jesus is the word of God made flesh, which is what Christians proclaim, then doesn't that, doesn't that say, teach us something about who God is essentially that might trouble some of the claims that, that Aquinas is making about God as octus purus and, and so forth and so on. And there's a long uh, history of debates about this and process theologians will go in a, in a particular direction there. Um, saying that actually we do have to think about God as part of the process of becoming of the world. Um, and, and, and the incarnation is a sign that God is not distant and abstract, but rather involved in the messiness of all of these things. Thomas will have their own particular way to try to account for that without losing their attachment to Aquinas' uh, principles about a kind of um, unchanging divine being. Um, for my part, I'm happy to entertain a number of ways of speaking about God um, in not just scholastic but also poetic registers and things like that, which I think can help to disclose a fuller sense of who God is. So, um, you know, Aquinas is someone I've, I intentionally focus on today for Aquinas Day. Um, but, you know, I think putting him in conversation with other theologians who might have a, a little bit more of a historicized sense of God's essence wouldn't be a bad thing, in my opinion. Anyone else? Okay, thank you so much. Sorry, Marie. It's been uh, wonderful to have you here with us. Um, it's been a great Aquinas Day celebration, and oh, thank you, thank you for coming and being with us and sharing your wisdom. And thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll do this again next year. Um, I, I want to, again, thank the Candler School of Theology, and particularly Tony and the Catholic Studies Department for helping us make this day uh, a wonderful day that it has been. So thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next year. Thank you.